I promised you an update on the status of the M1 Abrams for year 2021, and here it is, just in time for the end of the year. Well, son of a bitch. <gasps> It took significantly longer to complete this presentation than I had predicted, even though work was resumed recently, after it had been started literally years ago. If you can't tell simply by looking at the length of this video, or that I chose to split it into two consecutive parts, it should be pretty obvious that researching the more recent developments in the M1 took me down quite a rabbit hole. The failure, or perhaps unwillingness, of both the Pentagon and the media to put the big picture together on these issues is simply startling, but it's unfortunately not very surprising that you hear so little about the M1's failings. After all, the rent-seeking corporate media are practically owned and operated by their defense industry sugar daddies, while the independent press is constantly inundated by the countless other scandals that endlessly emerge from the military-industrial congressional complex. So now you will see the sum of what until now were almost all only spoon-fed to the public in bits and pieces, strategically spread as far apart from one another as possible to prevent the aforementioned big picture from emerging. The sources I used for this presentation, as usual, are cited in the video description. I've never stated as much within the body of the presentation before, as it's painfully obvious, but it seems a few of my viewers are slow studies. So let's get this out on a tray. Nice. The US Army has recently begun using a new variant of the M1A2 Abrams, much to the delight of the system's many cheerleaders. Originally called the M1A2 SEPB3, this tank was stuck in development hell for some time, as despite being merely an update of the M1A2 SEPB2, and the program running since at least 2010, the first prototype wasn't completed until 2015. For starters, it should be noted that there have been three separate iterations of the tank known as the M1A2 SEP, with the SEP acronym being shorthand for Systems Enhancement Package. Originally there was only one M1A2 SEP, but when it got a sequel in the late 2000s, it was redubbed the M1A2 SEP V1, with V1 being short for version 1, while the new update was designated V2. The M1A2 SEP V2 is now effectively the primary tank of the US military, but in the 2010s a new version of the M1A2 SEP was developed, dubbed the SEP V3. However, the M1A2 SEP V3 was nearly terminated in its infancy when the US Army decided there was no point in developing the M1 Abrams further, being rescued only by Congress forcing this unwanted tank upon them. But we'll look more into that later on. Seemingly embarrassed by how far they were kicking the can down the road with the M1A2 SEP, Instead of developing an M1A3, the army at some point in the late 2010s started referring to the M1A2 SEP V3 by a different designation. The SEP V3 was euphemistically redesignated as the M1A2C to lampshade the fact that it was the third iteration of a long and ongoing series of remedial corrections for developmental shortfalls. In fact, the original M1A2 was itself an attempt to make good on broken promises made for the M1A1. For example, the M1A1 was itself originally meant to have a CITV, a commander's independent thermal viewer, and every one of them had a circular hole cut through the roof armor to mount one in. The CITV meant for the M1A1 never materialized, and this is why you see a thin sheet metal discredited onto the forward left area of the turret roof of every M1A1. It keeps the element out, but it couldn't offer much armor protection. The M1A2C continues the same tired old upgrade scheme that defined the original M1A2, upgraded communications, sensors, computers, and frontal armor. The US Army's decision makers are bankrupt not only of imagination, but also the competency to recognize and or admit that they know it. The M1A2C ended up weighing more than 80 short tons, literally making it the heaviest tank in service anywhere. It's also the heaviest operational tank since the 83-ton Jag Tiger of World War II. 
no one in the army seems to have any concerns whatsoever about a ton of unprecedented in a combat vehicle, but the Pentagon's DOT and E director is sounding the alarm about the problems it will create. In a January 26, 2021 Defense News article, the DOT and E director notes in his own words the following. The Abrams M1A2 SCPV-3 upgrades introduce suitability concerns. Weight growth limits the tank's tactical transportability. The M1A2 SCPV-3 is not transportable by current recovery vehicles, tactical bridges or heavy equipment transporter. To give you an idea of how divorced from reality the Army's leadership is on this matter, the Program Executive Office Ground Combat Systems responses that the M1A2C is quote, recoverable, bridgeable, and transportable with no new restrictions above the current Abrams fleet, unquote. This is despite the fact that the never exceed payload of US Army recovery, bridging, and tank transport of vehicles being 80 tons is public record. The program office has also stated that, quote, further increase margins for further growth and safety on each of the supporting systems that enhance all combat systems successful employment and operation on the battlefield, unquote, as though you can wave magic wand over an M88A2 Hercules to magically allow it to upright a flipped 85 ton tank. The Defense News article also notes how the M1A2C's current weight represents a crisis in mobility in European terrain, where the weight limits of roads and bridges are too low for the M1A2C, particularly in Eastern Europe. Recall how M1s occasionally fell through bridges into canals in Iraq. The developing world is, after all, where virtually all future US conflicts will take place, as history has proven. The Russians aren't coming. It is also widely noted that the M1A2C will be fitted with an Under Armour APU, acronymed as UUAPU. Basically, an APU is a diesel generator that allows a tank to produce enough power to drive all of its systems without the tremendously greater fuel consumption of idling the engine to run the alternator. However, as you will recall from my earlier presentations, the vaunted UUAPU isn't a new feature. All of the M1A2 SEPs had them. Emphasis on the had part. I was informed by Vickers Independent, a longtime viewer of my presentations, that the UUAPU was so troublesome that it ended up being replaced by an extra Hawker armor safe battery. How long do you suppose the new UUAPU will last before it meets the same fate? The Army has also been promising a UUAPU for the M1 fleet since as far back as the early 1990s, a promise they keep breaking year after year. Another dirty little secret of the internal APU is that there isn't enough space for one inside the M1 Abrams turret, and installing one inside the hull required the removal of one of the two aft fuel cells. This reduced the M1A2's fuel capacity by 25%, and cut its range to just 210 miles. This also means that an M1A2 consumes all of its fuel in just 6 hours, not 8 hours as with the M1A1, forcing ever more e-fueling. Meanwhile, with 60% less fuel, a Leopard 2's MTU883 diesel engine can idle for over 72 hours non-stop. Recall that General Dynamics, who built the M1 fleet, has been trying desperately to re-engine them with the GD883 diesel. A copy of the MTU-883, and the army has been ignoring them continuously since the successful first demonstration of a diesel M1A2 in 2000. The M1A2C is also to finally receive an ERA package that doesn't attach only to the tusk kits that the army built solely for temporary use in the Iraq war. The much celebrated Eret explosive reactive armor tiles for the M1A2C only protect the lower hull sides via the track skirts, and in typical US Army fashion, this is too little, too late. US M1A1s and M1A2s have already been knocked out through their lower sides by the dozens in Iraq, by insurgents using the RPG-29 Vampire, a weapon rated to penetrate 650 mm of steel, after penetrating reactive armor. The side armor on the M1A2 Abrams isn't anywhere near the equivalent of a 650mm thick steel slab's protection, even on the M1A2C, and the RPG-29 entered service way back in 1989. 
There are also no error tile arrays planned for the rest of the hull, the turret, or the roof. ERA array patterns of the likes seen on Soviet T-72s since the 1980s. The current applique armor on the M1A2C's belly is also only an interim solution, as it is intended to eventually be replaced with a lighter array made of aluminum rather than steel. The belly plate of the M1A2C, however, is itself made of steel, which bear in mind, is basically a catch-all term for iron alloys. This fact is important for later, but first it is essential to distinguish between the two primary types of anti-tank mines. The aluminum plate may work against landmines that simply use large quantities of explosives to destroy or disable vehicles, but this is a fruitless endeavor, because even a tank without a mine protection kit will have its tracks or running gear destroyed by the blast no matter what. Not only is this the result these mines are made to accomplish, but because the blast is widely dispersed, they seldom penetrate the belly armor of main battle tank due to the amount of explosives being required to do so being quite sizable. As such, this type of anti-tank mine is generally referred to as counter-mobility anti-tank mines or blast mines, due to their unshaped explosive charge and dispersed blast, with common examples being the American M19, the Soviet TM46, the Italian TC6, and the Chinese Type 72. However, anti-tank mines with shaped charge heat warheads are a different matter. These pierce directly through the belly armor of a tank to kill the crew inside of it, and as such are referred to as casualty anti-tank mines. Common examples of casualty anti-tank mines are the Soviet TM-72, the US M-21, the Chinese Type 84, and the South African No. 8. Now, herein lies the problem. Casualty anti-tank mines commonly penetrate more than 60 mm of RHA steel, and even with the mine protection kit, the belly of the M1A2C can't protect against this. However, that's not even the worst part. Recall that the belly plate of the M1A2C is essentially iron, and the so-called improved mine protection plate planned for it is made from aluminum. In the process, the iron and aluminum dragged out of the armor plates through the penetration channel are finely pulverized under extreme heat and pressure, and expelled into an oxygenated environment inside the tank. Now what do you suppose the resulting reaction would be? It's gone out. Talk me through what's going on, mate. So instantly the thermite reaction starts, and you can see that it's so hot it's burnt a hole through the bottom of that terracotta flower pot. But if we go in close now, Brady, you can see all that really quite nice molten iron. Now that's so hot that the iron itself has melted and it's formed this really quite big goo in the bottom on the on the sand. Not even space armor or a V hull will protect against casualty anti-tank mines. The only viable solution is to sandbag the belly or floor of a vehicle. Which, needless to say, isn't a solution the army will adopt, as it isn't a means by which the defense industry can cheat the taxpayers out of hundreds of millions of ill-gotten dollars. Another showstopper the army accidentally let slip when promoting the M1A2C concerns the thermal imaging system used in the gunner's sights. But before we get to that, let's take a moment to look back on decades of broken promises regarding the TIS sights used in the M1 Abrams FOV. Also known as a flare, or forward-looking infrared scope, the TIS used in the original M1 Abrams was promised to have superior range, depth, and resolution compared to the passive thermal sights previously used on US tanks. The army and their mouthpieces even went so far as to claim it did, and still to this day, continue to float that narrative to the uninformed. The reality is, the military reform movement pointed out during the 1980s that the TIS would likely not be able to see through smoke or dust clouds, and couldn't see through fog at all. The army denied this, implying that it was the reformers' word against the army, but given that the sources cited were actually official army documentation, it was actually the army's word against the army. Operation Desert Storm proved how wrong the army's dismissal of the TIS's limitations was, most graphically during the Battle of Phase Line Bullet, which was one of the few battles that was actually won by the Iraqis. 
at phase line bullet, a US Army formation spearheaded by M1A1s drove through thick clouds of smoke from burning oil wells, but could hardly see anything in front of them, not the least of which was a sizable formation of dug-in Iraqi forces lying in ambush. The much cruder optics on the Iraqi tanks could see the US forces however, and they opened fire, knocking out several vehicles during the opening salvos. So poor was the visibility of the TIS sides and the M101s, that they couldn't discern a T-72 from a Bradley, nor even another M1A1, despite all of these vehicles having completely different sizes, shapes, and heat outputs. The M1A1s at phase line bullet ended up causing most of the losses suffered by M1s and Bradleys during Operation Desert Storm, including all of the K-killed M1A1s that had crewmen killed in battle. Chaos reigned, and panic devolved into a rout, driving the surviving US forces to retreat. And in doing so leaving the Iraqi forces, in control of the area, effectively resulting in an Iraqi victory, the coalition never made a second attempt to take phase line bullet either. Very few in the press noticed that the battle of phase line bullet even happened, much less what transpired during it, and fewer still recalled the warnings of the reformers during the prior decade. Few as well noticed that the M60A1 and M60A3 pattern tanks that fought in Desert Storm didn't have these problems, as their ANVGS2 tank thermal sights, or TTS, for short, had overwhelmingly superior range, resolution, and overall performance compared to the whose TIS used on the M1A1. Nor for that matter, that the TIS was so horrifically overpriced that enough money to buy just two of them was equal to the full unit cost of an entire M60A3 pattern, including its GTS. Which didn't prevent the army from retiring all of their M60s just five years later, but I digress. The army pleaded to give the system a second chance, that they would do better next time, that they have the technology now, or the usual lies. Back to the task and purpose article on the new M1A to see however, it also let slip, that of the 5200 M1A1s built for the US military, 3000 are out of service. An even more interesting tidbit from that story, is that the army has announced it would start retiring their M1A1s in 2021, and plan to have them all mothballed by 2025. As the US Marines have already retired all of their M1A1s, the most numerous M1 variant in the US inventory is on its way out. This will leave the US military with only one military branch operating less than 3,000 tanks, to protect all of the myriad US interests on the ground around the world. China presently has 8,000 operational main battle tanks, incidentally. There's also a new M1A2D in development, which will distinguish itself from all the M1A2S, characterized from previous M1s, that were distinguished by upgraded comms, sensors, computers, and frontal armor, by having upgraded comms, sensors, computers, and frontal armor. I can barely contain my enthusiasm. Interestingly, the May 26, 2019 National Interest article on the M1A2C titled, The US Army's new M1A2C Abrams tanks will enter service soon. Check them out, notes that out of the 5200 M1A1s bought by the US Army and Marines, only approximately 1000 are still in service. Moreover, this article also states, that the Army plans, to retire all of their M1A1s by 2025, literally just three years from now. It also notes that there are only 1,500 M1A2s in the US inventory, and of these, only 174 are planned to be rebuilt to M1A2C standard. Conspicuously absent from the Army's announcement is any mention as to whether it's more than 4,000 M1A1s will be rebuilt into M1A2s, scrapped sold abroad, or simply left to rust. Us lowly peasants are apparently unworthy of such knowledge, despite the fact that we pay all the bills of the US military, the most expensive government institution in recorded history. The M1 inventory is thus painting itself into an increasingly tinier corner, and in doing so, is burning down its last semblances of relevance. Or to put it another way, the US military still owns and operates over 800 bases in some 70 foreign countries.
if you think even 1500 tanks is enough to protect US interests across a geographical expanse this vast, I'm sorry to inform you that your judgment is irreparably damaged. And I reiterate that China has over 8000 tanks and climbing. I have no idea how much heavier the M1A2D will end up being, but if you think the M1A2C's weight is bad, now let's consider all of the other things that will have to be attached to it later. The army is finally adopting the Israeli developed trophy active protection system, but the trophy kit developed for the M1 increases its weight by 5 tons. When the M1A2C has to breach obstacles or minefields, it will have to be fitted with a mine plow or mine roller, adding another 10 to 15 tons. That adds up to a combined total of 100 short tons. Good luck finding anything but rocky ground and rubber concrete reinforced roads that can support a vehicle this size that weighs this much. That also means a ground pressure of 20.83 psi, almost twice that of most other main battle tanks, and almost the same as most military light trucks. Incidentally, it's that amount of ground pressure which is the reason why said trucks easily rut into the ground and get stuck when driving cross country. A new layer of armor has been added to the underside of the M1A2C to protect against landmines, but this not only increased the vehicle's weight even further, but also reduced its ground clearance, as this armor array inevitably must be hung underneath the belly. Another new protection feature added to the M1A2C is an integral jamming system to block detonation signals for IEDs and similar weapons. The specific range of radio signals these jammers emit are UWB, or ultra-wideband radio waves, which blocks a wide range of radio signals. The army and their publicists insist that UWB radio waves are perfectly safe for the soldiers constantly exposed to the mad or near the source, as these are the same radio waves used in mammograms. However, the Australian Medical Association publicly stated in 2013 that they suspected the cancer death of Kevin Dillon, an Australian soldier who extensively carried a backpack IED jammer in Afghanistan, was caused by the jamming equipment he carried. Problem is, mammograms have been proven to cause more cancer than they detect, as noted in a September 2015 story hosted by the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine. Along with the depleted uranium ammunition, depleted uranium armor, and hexavalent chromium gun tube lining, the anti-IED jammers can now join the growing list of things inside the M1 Abrams that cause cancer. With an honorable mention to the M1's FRH hydraulic fluid, whose absorption into the human body causes paralysis, which can result from as little as mere skin contact. However, the US Army has finally fielded a new multi-purpose round for use in the M1A2C, so it's not all bad news. Or is it? Where do I even start with the XM1147 AMP? This is going to be another very long segment, considering that it only covers a single munition, because there's far more wrong with the AMP round than meets the eye. I suppose I'll begin by explaining what it is. The AMP is a new multi-purpose round developed especially for the US Army's M1A2C. The publicity for the AMP round is bursting at the seams with technical gobbledygook that doesn't define what it actually is or what it does. So from here onward, I will refer to this round not as the AMP, but using the correct functional designation, HE frag. You heard that correctly. The High Explosive Fragmentation Projectile, a class of munition dating back to the 19th century, is now being hailed as a game-changing innovation only made possible by the galaxy brains in the Pentagon. Shrapnel shells were first issued in 1803, and the advent of high explosive shells in 1887 were added to the shrapnel round, to create the first HE frag rounds. And if you didn't already know that, then you do know the devastation fragmentary ammunition wrought during the First World War, where bursting artillery rounds killed more men than all other weapons combined. That the US Army has allowed M1s with 120mm guns to serve for nearly three decades without this capability, as vital as it is common worldwide, is abhorrent. The XM1147 HE frag is said to differ from previous munitions, in that it can be electronically programmed to detonate either on impact, or at a preset distance. 
This allows the XM1147 to be used against hard targets with much more concentrated explosive force, or to air burst in the middle of a cluster of soft targets to shower them with fragmentation and shell splinters. However, the XM1147 isn't the first HE frag round to do this. Fuse is programmable to allow for a selection of bursting altitudes or impact bursting, are as old as the pre-HE shrapnel rounds of yesteryear. A more modern example is the 100mm 53 uof 4 12 fired from the D-10T tank gun used in the T-54 series of main battle tanks. It has a fuse that can be programmed to detonate at the moment of impact, or to air burst, after flying a specific distance. These rounds use a mechanical fuse, but electronic fuses in HE frag rounds are old hat as well. The legendary VT fuse of World War II is one such example. The only difference between the XM1147 and all of the other AG frag rounds with programmable fuses is that the XM1147 isn't programmed manually by the crew, but electronically by the fire control system. Of course, this requires the unique fire control system of the M1A2C. None of the M1A1s or other M1A2s in the US inventory will be able to use the XM1147 without a drastic and invasive rebuild nor for that matter will any US allies. So much for the vaunted universal NATO tank ammunition interchangeability the US military always preaches. Think about how balls out insane this is. Every other HE frag round in history with a programmable fuse is set by hand for its burst setting, which is accomplished faster than the length of time the gunner takes to tell the loader what range he wants the fuse set to. The army has thus taken something that wasn't broken and fixed it until it was. With the XM1147, the loader still has to select and load the round by hand, and the gunner still has to decide the fuse setting, but now the tank itself has to be involved as a middleman. Providing, of course, that there aren't any problems with the fire control system, or that electrical power hasn't been lost due to battle damage or routine wear. It goes without saying that the obvious reason the US Army leadership took this approach was to turn a dirt cheap round into a heinously expensive one, for the purpose of fattening out their already unjustifiably excessive budget, and lining the pockets of the defense industry that said leaders hope will hire them after they retire from the Army. After all, HE frag rounds ordinarily have a three-digit price tag, and the Army can't have that, now can they? Still, at least the army is finally introducing a 120mm HE frag round compatible with the M1A2, which the US inventory is sorely lacking. Except that they didn't. The US marines beat them to it, and have already been using an HE frag round in their M1A1s for more than a decade, in the form of the Mark 324. The Mark 324 is the Rhine metal dm 11 HE frag round developed for the German Leopard 2 main battle tank but built under license in the US. The Mark 324 is already everything the XM1147 is, except for everything that's wrong with it, and it's already both stockpiled in the US inventory and in production. Allow me to reiterate that. The problem the XM1147 HE frag round was developed to solve, was already solved more than a decade ago. Leave it to the US Army's decision makers, to take a badly needed reform and vandalize it into another pitfall. If you thought the stupidity of the XM1147 HE frag round stops there, then buckle up, because this ride isn't over yet. The XM1147 is intended to replace not only the canister and MP80 rounds, but also HEOR and HEAT. This is simply madness. The M830A1 HEAT round, formerly known as MP80, was already a step in the wrong direction because it's less powerful than the M830, and trades that power for nothing. The projectile the M830A1 fires is that of the M456A2, a 105mm heat round, and is able to be fired from a 120mm gun, because the projectile is wrapped in a sabo. The primary factor in the penetration of a heat round is the diameter of the projectile, so a wider bore heat round of otherwise equal attributes to a narrower one will always penetrate more armor. The result is that the US military went from the Chad M830 that could penetrate 800mm of steel, to the Virgin M830A1 that will only penetrate 600mm. As for the trade-off mentioned earlier, the M830A1 added a fragmentation casing 
and an altitude-sensitive programmable fuse to the M456A2 projectile, resulting in a munition very heavily marketed for its usefulness against personnel and airborne helicopters. The result was a munition which, when actually used against personnel in the 2003 invasion of Iraq, was found to be hilariously useless against them. As reported in a 2004 Armour magazine article titled, The M1A1 Tank and Fragmentary Ammunition, the M830A1 not only failed to cause any casualties against Iraqi anti-tank missile teams in their fighting positions, but even failed to inflict any injuries upon them when they were standing straight up and running away in the open. The effectiveness of the M830A1 against helicopters was a boost as well, because helicopters tend to avoid conflict with tanks that have a very large force of protective fighter aircraft swarming overhead. Also, don't forget that the M1A2C is presently the only tank in all the world currently capable of using the XM1147HE frag round correctly, if the US Army ever has to pull M1A1s or earlier M1A2s out of storage to immediately send into a serious shooting war, they won't be able to fire it. This also means that all export customers operating M1A1s and previous model M1A2s won't be able to use the XM1147 either, unless they have the same kind of fire control system as the M1A2C, which is just another carrot the US State Department can dangle over the heads of supposed allies to bully them into obedience. An HE frag round can never match the demolition power of a HESH round of the same bore, nor is it as effective an armor penetrator as a heat round of the same bore. Of course, because a HESH round must be a long and very heavy projectile that is full bore along nearly its entire length, in order to have the required effects on the target, it can't be fired from a smooth bore gun. A projectile with those attributes is impossible to effectively stabilize without angular momentum imparted by a rifled gun barrel, and the projectile will you're in flight, going randomly off course. This is why the UK resisted smoothbore guns for so long, and only used rifled guns on all of their tanks, until they were finally coerced into adopting the Challenger 3. The Army's ceaseless self-congratulation over the XM1147HE frag is also in spite of the fact that they are late to the party where HE rounds for a smoothbore 120mm gun are concerned. For example, the IMHET round developed by NAMO in Norway has been in service with several NATO nations since at least 2015, and it was demonstrated in a video right here on YouTube. See the video description for a link to this demonstration. Not only did the US Marine Corps first field the Mark 324 HE round years ago, but so did Germany in 2009 as the DM-11. Even before that, France in 2005 had fielded the OE-120 F1 HE round for the Leclerc, and this round was also compatible with all other NATO standard 120mm smoothbore tank guns. In a James article, dated May 22, 2001, it was noted that the Israeli army already had the M3-29 Apam round in service, which was followed in 2004 by the even simpler M337 HEMP round. However, 120mm smoothbore HE rounds go back even farther. The Israeli and Swedish armies first fielded the SLS GRM-95 HE round, way back in the mid-1990s, when the US Army was still throwing temper tantrums over the mere suggestion that they should have munition like this. It isn't even as if developing an HE round for a smooth bore gun is difficult. The Soviet Union fielded the OF-11 HE round for the 115mm to a 20 gun used on the T-62 all the way back in 1961 leaving no justifiable excuse for the M1A1 Abrams not to have always had one from the first day it entered service. Recall that my prior presentations noted the absence of an HE frag round and the urgent need for one back in the 2000s, while the Iraq war and Afghan war were still raging. Only now is the army pursuing one, after they cut and ran from both of those wars, leaving the Iraqis to fend for themselves, and Afghanistan to once again fall to the Taliban. Ready, fire, aim. As is always the case with today's army, the XM1147 HE frag round is too little, too late, and completely wrong. Speaking of the Iraqis, let's look into how their M1A1 Abrams tank fleet has fared so far.
as the US government slowly rebuilt the Iraqi armed forces during the 2000s and 2010s, it was formally announced that Iraq would purchase M1A1Ms from the US. Naturally, no mention was made in the press as to whether Iraq actually requested these vehicles, or if Washington DC simply decided arbitrarily that they would just have them. The order was finalized in 2008, and the last deliveries of 140 M1A1Ms were made in 2010. In just two years, a third of these tanks had already been knocked out in combat, and yet the heaviest losses didn't occur until 2014. Not only did the Iraqi M1A1M inventory lose hulls, but battles as well. In 2014, a defense force that included M1A1Ms failed to prevent Mosul from being overrun and taken by ISIS, which took the Iraqi army two years and over 100,000 men to recapture. A year later in 2015, 40 Iraqi M1A1Ms had been irreparably destroyed or captured by ISIS, and the Iraqi army made a request for another 175 M1A1Ms, plus an additional 60 M1070 tank transporters. Yet, this didn't improve matters for the Iraqi army, they kept losing M1A1Ms to ISIS and other militant groups, not the least of which were a faction of Iranian-backed insurgents who captured 9 of the M1A1Ms at the end of 2017 got them back in working order, and then turned them on the Iraqi army who once operated them. Iraq's M1A1M losses are so substantial that GDLS not only reported most of them had been knocked out at some point, but that many were even rebuilt, after being knocked out in combat at least three times apiece. Rather than being concerned about the increasingly worsening situation in Iraq, the US government instead pitched a fit over the Iraqi M1A1Ms that were captured by the insurgents. Yes, you heard that right. The US government was concerned about the status of its property, rather than the security of the nation they professed to be their ally. They forced Baghdad to redirect their efforts to getting those M1A1Ms back, as though they weren't being constantly overrun on every side like a botched play through a factorio. The Iraqi army complied, and ultimately managed to seize, or completely destroy all of the captured M1A1Ms. Or, that is, except for two tanks. And only for this, the US government not only put the order for the 175 new M1A1Ms on hold, but also withdrew all of their support personnel for the M1A1M from Iraq. The Beltway even threatened to terminate most of the other arms programs for Iraq on hold, including the ongoing deliveries of F-16 Fighting Falcon fighter aircraft, very few of which were at the time in service in Iraq. The last time I checked, the rebels weren't flying captured F-16s. The embattled Iraqis were tired of being led on by the US State Department, having specifically requested several US weapon systems by name, notably the AH-64 Apache attack helicopter and A-10 Thunderbolt 2 ground attack aircraft, and were constantly denied. Sick of being constantly gaslit by the US government, Iraq gave up on asking for A-10s, Apaches, and more M1s, and instead went to Russia to ask for the Mi-28 Havoc attack helicopter, Su-25 Frogfoot ground attack aircraft, and T-72 main battle tank. To the surprise of only the US government, Moscow immediately granted permission, and orders for Su-25s, Mi-28s, and T-72s were confirmed immediately after. Not only that, but they've since expanded their orders for Russian arms, to include 170 T-90Ms. Deliveries of T-90s to Iraq began in 2018. And as of the last time the M1A1M embargo issue was apparently reported on in 2020, the US government is still refusing to allow any maintenance support or additional tank deliveries to Iraq. Later the same year, one of the Iraqi army's M1A1M brigades completed a full conversion to T-90s, beginning a long and still ongoing process of what can be described as de Abramsization. In short, the M1 Abrams has helped push a would-be US arms customer into the arms of Moscow, along with whatever influence Washington DC might have gained. All for the want of two M1A1s. But hey, at least none of the militant groups in Syria ended up using ex-Iraqi M1A1Ms. Right? You have to be wondering why is the M1 Abrams even in Syria at all? Well, 
Do you recall those dozens of Iraqi army M101Ms that ISIS and other militant groups captured? Take a guess at where they ended up. This created quite the imbroglio, as those tanks needed to be taken out pronto, but the Iraqi Air Force was unable to enter Syrian airspace without causing an international incident and potentially a war with Syria. None of the militant groups in Syria backed by the US had the means of quickly destroying all of these M1A1Ms, while the Turks were too busy fighting their own private little dirty war, and Israel, commonly referred to incorrectly as a US ally, couldn't be bothered. That basically meant that the Syrian or Russian air forces would eventually bomb the M1A1Ms, unless the US military flew in first and did it themselves. And that's exactly what the US military did. Witness the farcical situation of the US military bombing what were essentially their own tanks. Even more humiliating, the outcome of these punitive airstrikes on the captured M1A1Ms meant one of two things would result. Either the M1A1M would prove too heavily armored for the latest and greatest US aerial weapons to kill, causing US air power to lose face, or they would be knocked out easily by air power, causing the US tank inventory to lose face. The US Army also quietly deployed M1A1 and or M1A2 Abrams tanks to Syria as well. I would otherwise be more specific about what the US Army's M1s did in Syria, but as no articles have been forthcoming, their contributions to the war were apparently unfit for print, as it were. However, the Army's M1s ultimately contributed so much to the efforts of the US-backed factions that the Syrian government forces ultimately won. In other words, the M1 Abrams lost another war. The most recent non-US fleet of M1 Abrams tanks to engage in combat for the first time are the M1A2s of the Saudi Arabian army during their intervention into the Yemeni civil war. To the surprise of what should have been no one, the M1A2 has been a complete washout. The internet is inundated with videos of the Houthi rebels knocking out Saudi M1A2s with rockets, anti-tank missiles, and roadside bombs, and there isn't any shortage of Houthi photographs of numerous different abandoned or destroyed M1A2s either. In 2016, Saudi Arabia asked for another 153 M1A2s from the US government, and this request was granted. In case you're wondering. The US State Department looked the other way, while the Saudis were abandoning dozens of intact M1A2s to the Houthis, while simultaneously screaming at the Iraqis, and threatening to terminate arms sales over literally just two tanks not being accounted for. What's interesting is that Saudi Arabia's 2016 order for 153 more M1A2s mentioned in passing, that 20 of them were replacements for battle losses. On the surface, that might sound like the Saudi army lost only 20 M1A2s to the Houthis, but the thing about tanks is that they are notoriously difficult machines to destroy beyond repair. Even a mere T-62 with its turret thrown sky-high by ammunition exploding inside the hull can still be repaired, refurbished, and put back into service. Had the Saudis only suffered 20 M1A2s knocked out by enemy fire, they would simply scoop them up ship them back to the US, and have GDLS rebuild them. To instead require 20 outright replacement vehicles instead proves that this many M1A2s were so violently blown to pieces that it's not even worth the trouble to try to weld the bits and pieces back together. Given that only a tiny number of tank losses are ever so bad that they aren't repairable, that should give you an idea of how huge the total number of Saudi Army M1A2 losses have been. At least a quarter of their total M1A2 inventory must have been knocked out at least once in this war. Worse still for the M1A2, this order was placed in 2016, only 16 months after the Saudi intervention into Yemen began. As I write this very sentence in late 2021, it is now more than 5 years since that order was placed, and the Saudi armed forces are still fighting in Yemen with no chance of victory in sight. On a single evening. Houthi rebels knocked out 4 M1A2s using 9 M113 Kankas ATGMs. So you understand what a disaster this was for the M1A2, the 9 M113 Kankas missile, codenamed 85 Spandrel by NATO, is an ATGM that first went into service over 4 decades ago in 1974. 
the original Kankas was rated to penetrate 600 mm of RHA steel, which US military folklore holds to be inadequate penetration to defeat even the much more weakly armored M1 from 1980, but here we see this missile felling the M1A2. Granted, the later 9M113M Kankas M introduced in 1991, codenamed 85B or Spandrel B by NATO, is rated to penetrate 800mm of RHA steel, and this would easily knock out any tank ever put into service. However, given that the Kankas M is still considered a first-line missile by all of the nations that use it, the notion that any of them would supply a missile this powerful to a faction as volatile and capricious as the Houthis is laughable. To give you an idea of what a complete cluster truck of a war this M1A2 spearheaded intervention has become for Saudi Arabia, President Joe Biden formally announced in February of 2021 that the US government would no longer supply military hardware to Saudi Arabia. But don't worry, Saudi Arabia will win in the end, just like the M1 guaranteed for its users in Somalia, Iraq, Iraq again, and again, Syria, and Afghanistan. Yes, Afghanistan. M1A1s were sent there. Despite the fact that the Afghan war started in 2001, M1s were awoled from Afghanistan until 2010. Even then, the entire deployment considered of only M1A1s, not the vaunted new M1A2, and they were marine tanks, not army tanks. And only 16 M1A1s were deployed to Afghanistan, ever. The few news articles that bothered to mention them at all noted that the Marine M1A1s were engaged in convoy escort, security, and overwatch missions, but conspicuously absent from all of them were any accounts of the M1A1s exchanging fire with the enemy. In other words, the M1A1s were uselessly driving in circles. Almost 11 years after their deployment, there isn't a single news article on the internet which mentions these vehicles ever even so much as participating in a combat action, let alone exchanging fire with the enemy. Either that, or if there is evidence, it's buried very very deep. A late September 2021 Google search with the terms M1A1 Abrams and Afghanistan yields a mere 11 pages of search results, none of which link to any evidence that any M1A1 ever fired a shot in anger in Afghanistan. It's not as if there has been a shortage of combat against the Taliban, but more likely than not, there has probably been a shortage of fuel, given that a single M1A1 Abrams consumes more fuel in 8 hours than any contemporary or later main battle tank with a diesel engine consumes in 2 days of ceaseless engine idle. That also likely explains why mere 16 M1A1s were deployed to Afghanistan. When you consider how much logistical effort is required to keep even a battalion of M1A1s functioning in a country like Afghanistan, then it becomes obvious just how boned the US Marines would have been, if they either sent any more, or used them for anything other than photo opportunities. Contrary to the false impression of strength and utility projected from M1 operations in the Middle East, in which the US military's tank fleet was constantly fed by locally available unlimited free fuel, ISAF struggled to keep its forces adequately fueled in Afghanistan. We are about to venture into an extremely long tangent here, but it is necessary to give you an idea of how hopeless it would have been to employ the M1A1 Abrams in a useful capacity in Afghanistan. There's virtually no oil drilling or refining in Afghanistan, and no infrastructure available nor that ISAF was capable of building to stall large reserves of their own fuel, and no pipelines into the country. Moreover, as shown graphically in past military operations, notably Operation Market Garden, the Battle of Stalingrad, and the Battle of Dien Bien Phu and the French Indochina War, keeping a large military force adequately resupplied continuously and entirely by air is effectively impossible. Despite NATO being supported by most of the combined airlift of the Western Bloc, Ironically much of the Eastern Bloc's airlift as well, and even the aid of numerous civilian airlines and cargo airlift services, they found that almost all the fuel they ended up bringing into Afghanistan was trucked in. The few roads leading into Afghanistan capable of supporting tanker truck traffic were remote, 
treacherous, in severe disrepair, boiling with Taliban ambushes and sabotage, heinously long, and mostly ran through nations unable or unwilling to allow convoys supporting ISAF operations to pass through their borders. The only routes that were reliably permitted for use by military convoys in and out of the country were those that crossed the border into Pakistan, a country itself half overrun by a Taliban affiliated insurgency of its own, and the few highways available cross the border at remote bridges, notably those crossing the infamous Khyber Pass. Bridges that were effectively impossible to protect at all times, and as such, were incessantly attacked by Taliban sappers, who dropped these bridge spans with alarming regularity, and they constantly blocked tunnels with engineered landslides or avalanches, or even simply blowing them up. The fuel supply route was over 1,200 miles long and itself impossible to even partially secure along its full length at all times, as a single Taliban ambush in 2008 that destroyed 42 fuel trucks graphically demonstrated. That doesn't even include all of the trucks that are cut off or even outright lost from naturally occurring landslides, avalanches, and road collapses, all of which are frighteningly frequent in the jagged and crumbling mountains of southern Afghanistan. Even accidental fires and explosions of fuel tankers were a common occurrence, and they could be quite horrific. The Soviets had the same experience in the 1980s, and in 1982, a single accidental fire in a fuel truck convoy moving through the mile and a half long Salem tunnel resulted in a veritable inferno that barbecued some 2000 Afghans and Soviet soldiers before it could be extinguished. NATO was more than a little bit thirsty for fuel, incidentally. In 2007, they consumed over 507,000 gallons of fuel every single day in Afghanistan, and 80% of the fuel they burned was produced in Pakistani refineries in Trukton. As if consuming a half million gallons of fuel every day wasn't bad enough, the fuel storage facilities at the NATO facilities in Bagram and Kabul combined held less than 3 million gallons of fuel, leaving NATO with at most 6 days of fuel at normal use rates in the event that they were completely cut off from all international supply. Construction of more fuel storage facilities were authorized later in 2007, but only for another 3 million gallons, and it still didn't secure roads that inevitably would be required to supply almost all incoming fuel. Disputes with neighboring countries that popped up also constantly stopped entire routes, some of them permanently. In 2015 for example, disagreements with NATO led Moscow to permanently closing all of the supply corridors out of Russia, leaving NATO more dependent than ever on Pakistan. Not only did the Taliban constantly hinder deliveries of fuel, but international incidents with Pakistan resulted in Islamabad outright halting all fuel shipments on at least two occasions. The first of these occurred in 2010, after a NATO helicopter attacked Pakistani troops inside Pakistan's own borders, killing two of them. This fuel embargo lasted two weeks, and recall that NATO was only able to store enough fuel in its two primary bases at that time, to stay adequately supplied for only six days. The second embargo began only a year later in November of 2011 after a massive, elaborate, and protracted NATO air attack that again killed Pakistani troops inside Pakistani territory, this time 24 of them. Matters weren't helped by the US government lambasting Pakistan five weeks later over the embargo's expected economic impact on the region, a brazen act of Davo against the nation the US had just wronged. As opposed to, for a hypothetical example, simply apologizing. The talks dragged on into April of 2012, but then suddenly came to a crashing halt when the Barack Obama administration publicly refused to apologize for the attack that, to reiterate, killed Pakistani troops inside Pakistani territory. And the news outlets are acting like the Kabul airport in Bronio is the first time that Washington DC outed themselves as fair weather friends to their partners abroad. In the meantime, NATO had to get all of their fuel from much longer and slower alternate supply routes, at what ended up being six times the price tag, which ended up being more than 100 million US dollars each month. April of 2012 became May, May became June, and June became July, all through which the embargo held. It then ended suddenly in July, when the Obama administration went back on their word and apologized. 
Even then, Pakistan now had a special condition to allow further fuel deliveries. For every tanker truck driven into Afghanistan, the US government was now charged $5,000. Not to sound like a broken record, but recall that the gas turbine powered M1A1 Abrams in the field consumes more fuel every 8 hours than its diesel powered contemporaries consume in 2 days. It isn't much of a stretch of the imagination to assume that in the event the US military has to fight another war with strained logistics and without the luxury of the enemy not necessitating the deployment of hundreds of M1s just to keep the front lines from collapsing. As was the case in Afghanistan, they'll be eating a heaping helping of hurting. Still, as noted in the January 20, 2011 CENTCOM article titled Marine Tanks Prepare for Their First Missions in Afghanistan, written by Corporal Ned Johnson of 1st Marine Division, this was the very first time tanks ever operated in Afghanistan, so of course the logistics were going to be a problem. Except that the article's claims are so false, it's amazing that the pants of everyone in CENTCOM weren't on fire. The Afghan army operated tanks long before the Soviet-Afghan war, and during that conflict the Soviet army practically drowned the country in tanks. It's also not even the slightest bit true that tanks weren't used in Afghanistan from the start of the Afghan war in 2001. Not only was the ANA equipped with ex-Soviet tanks in operational service since at least 2005, but so were several regional factions across the country, and even the Taliban. It also isn't true that the Marines M1A1 Abrams tanks were the first ISAF tanks to be shipped into Afghanistan, as the Canadian Army first deployed Leopard C2 main battle tanks to Afghanistan in 2006. It can't even be argued that the M1A1 Abrams was the first tank of its generation ever deployed into Afghanistan either, given that the Canadian Army's contemporary Leopard 2s arrived in 2007. The complete and utter nothing burger of the M1A1's deployment also stands in stark contrast to the actions of other NATO tanks, some of which ended up unexpectedly defining and even shaping the Afghan war in the late 2000s and early 2010s. For example, Danish Leopard 2 snatched victory from the jaws of defeat against the Taliban in the Battle of the Helmand River, while the arrival of Leopard C2s allowed Canadian forces to finally use hash rounds to destroy the rugged structures the Taliban frequently used as cover, which the M240 to 25 mm auto cannons on their LAB3s had failed against. Oh, and in case you're wondering, when the Marine M1A1s were finally withdrawn, given that the US military retreated from Afghanistan in August of 2021, they didn't. Forbes reports that those M1A1s now belong to the Taliban, and if they had been scuttled, or at least sabotaged by the US military, before they fled the country, the Pentagon isn't saying anything about it. So that's two mass murdering violent extremist militant groups we can now count among M1 Abrams operators, ISIS, and the Taliban. Still, the Marines only left 16 tanks in Afghanistan, so it's not as if they suddenly lost their entire tank fleet. Right? The US Marines suddenly announced out of nowhere in the summer of 2020 that they were going to retire all of their M1A1 Abrams tanks and replace them with one of the few things worse than an M1A1 Abrams. Nothing. The USMC M1A1s had a lot of unique capabilities that no other M1s have ever used in an operational capacity, such as a deep fording kit with a snorkel, dozer blade compatibility, the M101 Raven remote weapon system, a tank infantry telephone, and the Mark 324HE frag round. Expect the Pentagon to start pretending none of these things ever existed after another year or two. I would have more to say about that decision, but retired Marine Colonel, Mark Kanchen puts it best. The Marine Corps likes to think of itself as kind of a Swiss Army knife. But this will be a Swiss Army knife whose owner has ripped out a couple of blades, because he doesn't think he's going to need them anymore. I've heard the Marine Corps argue that they can get these missing capabilities from other services, particularly from the Army. But I think that's unlikely. I think, if the Marine Corps wanted those assets, that a combatant commander would have to take them away from the Army, which would engender a bitter inter-service fight. 
To add insult to injury, the marines also incentivized all of their former tankers to retire quickly before they had even shipped away the last of their tanks. Major Craig Thomas, a spokesman for the USMC, stated that, to quote, Marines approved for this program will be considered to have completed their full active service commitment. In other words, the USMC leadership are making it clear that their former tankers not only aren't wanted, but they are essentially being outright banished, making this program effectively a philosophical and ideological purge as well. After all, the best way to avoid hearing dissent is to lock everyone in a position to have any diversity of opinion out of your echo chamber. This decision was also made as the Pentagon begins to pursue in earnest its Pacific Pivot policy, a strategy for basically re-enacting the World War II Pacific Island hopping strategy. Though in case you've forgotten, the US combat operations in the Pacific theater in World War II heavily relied on tanks to win the day, in no small part due to the fact that Japan deployed tanks of their own to the Pacific Islands. Even as late as 1944, Japan was still able to operate tank formations on their Pacific holdings, and the largest tank battle of the Pacific War took place during the Battle of Saipan. This is despite the fact that Japan produced only 6,450 tanks between 1931 and 1945, according to Japanese tanks 1939-45 by Stephen J. Zaloga. The US, meanwhile, produced more than 49,000 examples of the M4 Schumann between 1942 and 1945, not even considering all of the other US tanks built before and during the war. Just try not to think about the fact that China has over 8,000 tanks, more than 300 of which are amphibious. And unlike Japan's tanks during World War II, none of China's tanks suck. However, the US Marines aren't the faction that should be most concerned about the Chinese tank inventory. It was announced in 2019 that Taiwan had finally made a formal purchase of M1 Abrams tanks, after literally decades of flip-flopping on the issue, and a variant dubbed the M1A2T is being developed for them. This means that 40 years after the M1 Abrams entered service, and 36 years after it actually became operational, the M1 Abrams family of vehicles finally has a grand total of 7 user nations. During its first 40 years of service, the M60 Patton family of vehicles was exported to more than 20 nations. But I digress. However, Taiwan will soon learn the hard way that the M1 Abrams is an unshakable albatross around its neck, whose long-term consequences will be disastrous. The failure of Taiwan to seriously consider a different tank is a historic aberration, as they have a long track record of importing non-American weapons when it suited them. The most famous examples are the French Lafayette class frigates, Apelles rocket launcher, and Mirage 2000 fighter, the Dutch Zwaardvis class submarines, the German built F 104G Starfighter and MWW 50 minesweepers, and even the Japanese built JF 104D Starfighter. Taiwan thus could have imported Leclerc's, Leopardus, Altes, Challenger 2's, Merkavus, or any number of other smaller, lighter, cheaper, and less troublesome to operate main battle tanks than the M1A2. In fact, given Taiwan's silly terrain, the ideal tank for them would arguably be the South Korean K2 Black Panther. Whether Taiwan will receive all of the M1A2Ts they ordered within the price range and time frame agreed upon is also questionable, as such dealings by Washington DC with other nations are notoriously bipolar and treacherous. The Rockoff's French-made Mirage 2000s, for example, were ordered in 1992 only after then US President George Bush suddenly flaked on Taiwan, refusing to sell them a promised second shipment of F-16s, in order to help further ingratiate Washington DC to Beijing. This happened again in 2011 when then-President Barack Obama blocked yet another sale of F-16s to Taiwan, further proving that Washington DC isn't a trustworthy arms supplier. If the Roka decides later they don't have enough M1A2Ts, it's highly probable that any subsequent order will be blocked by future US presidents or congressmen. The best predictor of future behavior is relevant past behavior. Taiwan is also purchasing only 108 M1A2Ts. 
they have over 1000 M60 patterns, so this purchase couldn't have much positive effect on their national defense. As the state of preparedness of Taiwan's military is a complete basket case, it can be expected to become that much worse due to the increased operational and logistical burden inflicted by the M1A2T. For one, the M1A2T is too large and heavy for most of Taiwan's terrain and infrastructure, which will severely limit the amount of accessible terrain relative to the M60. The same infrastructure problem happened in Australia with the M1A1A MSA some years back. However, we are going to look further into the M1 Abrams Australian debacle later in this presentation. First, let's move on to the most dire problem the M1A2T represents for Taiwan, its fuel consumption, and Taiwan's pitiful loyal reserves. The M1A2Ts will each hold 505 gallons of fuel, assuming they don't have UUAPUs, and as we've seen before, the M1 Abrams has quite a drinking problem. That is, or three full loads of fuel every single day drinking problem. Rounding off 108 tanks with a 505 gallon fuel capacity each, that means roughly 150,000 gallons of fuel will be burned every day, while all of these tanks are active. The Roka, as it is, can barely support the fuel consumption of their 1000 M60 patterns, without stacking an extra 150,000 gallons a day on top of that burden. Let's recall from an earlier episode, that a division strength formation of 350 M1s consumes more fuel per day than General George Patton's entire army in Europe during the Battle of the Bulge, and they still ran out of fuel. Taiwan will now stack approximately one third of that burden atop their already overtaxed logistics. Of course, the AGT-1500 gas turbine is a tri-fuel engine, which can burn diesel, gasoline, or jet fuel as needed. Except that in practice, it isn't. Diesel burns too dirty for the moving parts and exhaust system to cope with, and gasoline burns too hot, and generally isn't available to ground formations in modern western bloc armies anyway, so the AGT-1500 inevitably only burns jet fuel. This should come as to no surprise to anyone familiar with the sordid history of the Leyland L60 engine used in the Chieftain tank. Because this tri-fuel engine also never ended up burning anything other than one type of fuel in an operational capacity. Of course, in the case of the Chieftain, that fuel was diesel oil, because the rest of the vehicles in the armies that use them burned diesel almost exclusively. But in the case of the M1 Abrams FOV, they consume almost all of the fuel burned by the armed forces that use them. Hence, the obvious reason why the US Army spent a king's ransom on converting all of its other ground vehicles to run on jet fuel instead of diesel. Let's hope the Roka can somehow pull all the prerequisite additional jet fuel logistics and infrastructure needed for the M1A2T out of a hat. They'll absolutely have to as well, because unlike all of the other M1 Abrams users to date, Taiwan has neither large domestic oil reserves, nor easy and completely secure access to imported oil, unless you count the Taliban, that is. 98% of Taiwan's fuel is imported, and they only have 2.2 million barrels of oil reserves, their domestic oil consumption alone, which needless to say, does not include their military consumption, exceeds 1.1 million barrels of oil every single day. I kid you not. Taiwan's oil reserves are only large enough to run their entire economy for just two days. Dependency on imported coal and petroleum has increasingly been recognized as a national crisis in Taiwan, to such an extent that they actually voted in a 2018 referendum to refuse becoming a nuclear-free zone. Now let's consider that Taiwan is an island, imports essentially all of its oil by sea, and that they are only 100 miles away from an adversary who has the world's largest air force and second largest navy. See a problem here? Even if we ignore the logistics and infrastructure shortfalls of the M1A2T, there's still another 72-ton elephant in the room, maintenance. As we've seen before, an M1 in the field spends more time under maintenance or refueling than it does on station, and a news article from Australia dropped a bombshell that even I somehow missed. 25% of the US Army's entire maintenance budget is consumed annually by the AGT-1500 gas turbine alone. 
how a fragile and fuel-starved state like Taiwan is supposed to be able to carry such a monstrous logistical burden has yet to be explained. Taiwan isn't the first Pacific nation to be swindled into buying the M1 Abrams FOV, however. You have probably noticed at some point that Australia has become an operator of the M1 Abrams FOV in the form of the M1A1 MSA. What you probably haven't noticed is that the entire affair has been a comedy of errors, showstoppers, and false triumphs. The ADF said thanks, but no thanks to the DU armor inserts originally offered for their M1A1s and selected ceramic inserts instead. It also turns out the M1A1 Abrams is too large and heavy for most of Australia's infrastructure. At a combat weight of 70 short tons, it's too heavy for road bridges in Northern Territory, which are built to a load capacity of 55 short tons. Australian railroads can't support the M1A1 either. When the first 18 M1A1s arrived at Port Melbourne, the Adelaide 2 Darwin rail line complained that they didn't have any trains capable of transporting them. The ADF consulted another Adelaide-based company, Freightlink, whose reply was that the M1A1s were too large for their rails and trains as well. Australia also lacked any tank transporters, or landing craft capable of carrying 70-ton loads, and public roads capable of supporting their weight, effectively leaving the first M1A1 shipment initially bottled up in Port Melbourne. Somehow missing from the debate about whether the ADF's procurement of the M1A1 Abrams was a good idea is the obvious fact that, if Australia's infrastructure and terrain weren't strong enough to support a 70-ton tank, it is effectively impossible to use it in the rest of the South Pacific. Or perhaps you suppose that Java's road bridges can support a 70-ton vehicle? The M1A1's fuel consumption also proved to be problematic carrying almost twice the fuel as the Leopard AS1s they replaced, yet having a slightly shorter range. As a consequence, the 1st Armoured Regiment in Darwin had to buy an extra 8 fuel trucks in anticipation of the arrival of the first 18 M1A1s. Despite the M1A1s being delivered with 6 M88A to Hercules ARVs, it seems the M1A1s get stuck and flip over a lot more often than anticipated, if the 2017 order for another 7 M88A2s is any indication. One of the articles covering the ADF's M1A1 procurement also noted that its long-term maintenance and upkeep were a daunting task, given that a whopping 25% of the US Army's entire maintenance budget each year goes directly to the AGT-1500 gas turbine. Moreover, recall from before that only 2200 of the US military's 5200 M1s are actually in service. Yet this is the best that the most heavily funded army in history is capable of managing. The ADF ended up buying new landing craft with a much higher tonnage capacity just for the M1A1 in the form of the LCM1E. The RAN's 12 LCM1Es were imported from Spain, primarily to carry the 70-ton tank ashore, but even then they had to be custom-built to a new configuration that allowed for the M1A1 to be carried, and deliveries were slow. The plan to buy the LCM1E wasn't formalized until 2009, even though Australia had already bought their M1A1s in 2007, and the actual order wasn't signed until 2011. The first batch finally arrived in 2015, and the last were delivered in 2018, a whopping 11 years after the M1A1s were ordered. Even by then, further testing and evaluation on the LCM1E, literally years of it, were still ahead of the ADF, and they decided to acquire an interim measure. The chosen interim ended up being the raft-like Mexa float, despite this system being designed for calm rivers, and not even having so much as a guardrail around its sides. Unsurprisingly, the M1A1 proved too heavy for the Mexa float, and during tests the freeboard dropped dangerously low, too low to carry an M1A1 in an operational capacity. The ADF just gave up on the mechs afloat, and waited until the LCM-1Es were finally delivered, and testing was completed. The LCM-1E trial finally took place in 2019, and the first exercise involving a tank delivered in an operational capacity occurred in June of 2021. 
However, this leaves Australia the ability to amphibiously deliver only 12 tanks simultaneously by sea. Predictably, the ADF tried to deflect from these problems by reminding the public that the RAAF's C-17 Globemaster III transport aircraft were capable of carrying the M1A1. What they didn't mention was that a paved and concrete reinforced runway 5 miles long was required just to get a C-17 carrying 70 tons safely into or out of the air, which eliminates it as a viable means of deploying the M1A1 to the Pacific Islands, where the ADF anticipates the need for armored vehicles. It wasn't even until 2012 that an RAAF C-17 carried an M1A1 for the first time, and even then it only flew from Darwin to Byfield, a distance of less than 1,500 miles. Despite the reason for this airlift being an exercise the M1A1 was to participate in, only two of them were delivered. You fight the way you train, never having enough tanks on hand included. The ADF justified all of this by the insistence that they need the M1A1 for its commonality with US forces, who they insist they will operate alongside. Meanwhile, the US Marines have retired their entire M1 fleet without replacement, and despite the Afghan and Iraq wars raging throughout the entirety of the 2010s, ADF M1A1s have never made a combat deployment. As of early 2022, the ADF M1A1 still haven't been deployed in battle. While the tanks stayed home safe and sound, at least 40 Australian soldiers were killed in both of the aforementioned wars. However, none of the aforementioned imbroglios have managed to rub the two collective brain cells of the ADF's leadership together to make them realize their mistake, and on April 29, 2021, they announced an expanded purchase. Now they are buying 160 more M1A1s, in part to convert some of them into 29 M1150 assault breacher vehicles and M1074 joint assault bridges, along with 129 spare AGT-1500 gas turbines. And yet another 6 M88 at a Hercules. And the most insane part? They want to remanufacture 75 of their M1A1s into M1A2 SEPV3s, which as you might recall from earlier, is designated as the M1A2C in the US Army. And which weighs a crushing 80 plus tons. Add the ADF to the growing list of military organizations that have jumped off the diving board on the edge of reason. It was formally announced in July of 2021 that Poland made a $6 billion purchase of 250 M1A2 Abrams tanks. A decision that has no doubt since played a vital role in deterring Russian aggression in the region. It's interesting that Poland was so quick to jump onto the gold brick bandwagon, given how poorly their other recent dealings with the US government have gone. For instance, Washington DC chilted Poland first into buying a fleet of defective and excessively worn F-16s, and then into committing to purchase F-35s, despite lacking all of the prerequisite resources and facilities required to operate them. The official justification for Poland's M1A2 purchase is to increase their interoperability with the US and NATO, as though the more than 200 Leopard 2s Poland already has aren't interoperable with the Leopard 2s used by 10 other NATO countries. Or for that matter, that US Army M1A2s will somehow be able to swap parts with Poland's Leopard 2s, or the 250 PT-91 Twardy and 400 T-72 main battle tanks that Poland still can't afford to retire. The Leopard 2 might be able to run on jet fuel, but T-72 variants are another matter. Also, no one seems to be commenting on the fact that, even though Poland spent $6 billion on their M1s, they only received 250 of them. That means a unit cost of $24 million, which is twice the offered price tag of a Leopard 2 a 7, and fully 10 times the cost of a used Leopard 2 a 4. The 72-ton elephant in the room, that no one is addressing. However, is how much fuel the M1A2 Abrams consumes, and how much Poland has available. As a single M1A2 consumes 1,700 gallons of fuel per day, and a barrel of oil is 42 gallons, those 250 M1A2s will consume 10,120 barrels of fuel each day. 
that's equivalent to 15% of Poland's entire daily fuel production at 53,367 barrels per day, but that's not even the worst part. Poland's oil consumption per day is a startling 11 times higher than their oil production, and that's only for their domestic oil consumption. This is also not considering that the obvious reason for Poland to have in one A2s is to fight Russia, whose air power is eclipsed only by the US and China, and whose missile arsenal is second to none. Meaning, on the very first day of war with Russia, most of Poland's oil refineries, oil pipelines, tanker ships, tanker trucks, and fuel silos will go up in smoke, and that's not even considering how much additional damage Russia's air and missile attacks will cause if they decide to deliver nuclear ordnance. This is also ignoring the fact that Poland's only seaports are on the Baltic Sea, which is a de facto Russian lake, and that the Russian Navy has more submarines in active service than the entire combined Polish Navy inventory of all types of ships. Still, at least Poland produces some of its fuel, and it's not like the US government would dupe a nation that produces hardly any oil at all into buying the M1 Abrams. No reporters anywhere seem to be asking how Polish infrastructure, most of which is left over from the Cold War, and when you could only barely support much lighter Soviet-made tanks, is expected to support the weight of the M1A2. It's as though the press has been given a gag order on this dilemma. I had originally anticipated that the 2022 update on the steady decline of the M1 Abrams would be relatively brief. Well, that sure went out the window, because no matter how bad the M1 already seems, you keep finding out how much worse it is every time you read something new about it. The overflow from this presentation made it inevitable that a second video would have to be created to give you the full scope of what a complete stuff up the M1 Abrams is today, and part 2 will be posted eventually. I say eventually, because I hadn't anticipated that part 1 itself would require so much time to create, or be this great in length. There ended up being almost 400 lines in part 1 alone, and this very sentence that you're listening to is almost the 400th in the script. So that said, keep an eye out for part 2. Unless YouTube ends up removing it, that is. God knows why, as the content of my presentations doesn't violate any of their rules, and their admins are aware that I make an effort to avoid doing so. After all, it's not like I'm even so much as mentioning the coronavirus.